Um, hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us tonight. Um, I was already introduced, but um, I am a graduate student at UC Davis, and I study geology. Specifically, I study paleoclimate, or um, the history of Earth's climate. So the debate on climate change has been raging since before I was born. As someone who is most comfortable with herself when she is outside, I have always felt a strong pull towards environmentalism. The preservation of wilderness is a logical extension of self-care for me. <clears throat> Listening to this desire, I took environmental science classes in college. I vividly remember the first time I was struck by the importance of managing climate change, ironically sitting in a cold lecture hall. We were viewing maps of the east coast of the United States that had been altered to show the landscape and coastline when glaciers had melted enough to cause one meter of sea level rise. I was shocked to see the Potomac River flood over the region where I grew up, the greater Washington, D.C. metropolitan area. Rock Creek Park, with the bunnies and squirrels that scampered away from me as I ran the trails, the flowers that I loved to pick, and even the poison ivy that irritated my skin would all be underwater. Those furry animals would have to move and the flowers and ivy would be fish food. I realized that because of climate change, parts of the world that I grew up in would be gone within my lifetime. So I decided to study climate change. I got rid of my car and started taking the train or carpooling. I began eating mess less meat and carrying reusable bags. I work every day to reconstruct how the Earth has previously coped with drastic climate changes in the hopes of discovering some part of the climate system, some lever that we might be able to pull and reverse or at least slow the warming of our planet. I dedicate my time to educating students and others about climate change and try to pass along useful tips to individuals for how to reduce their carbon footprint. Nevertheless, our planet continues to warm. In my lifetime, 26 years, atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations have risen over 50 parts per million. This rate of rise, two parts per million per year, is unprecedented in Earth history. The natural feedbacks that mitigate rises in Earth's temperature have never before responded to this rapid of a change. The geologic record does show us that life on Earth is resilient and will continue through a dramatic change such as this. However, the life that occurs after this change will be, like my drowned park, very different from what existed before. Humanity must cope with this change. We must take action, like all of you today, to educate ourselves and mitigate climate change. And with this, I am pleased to introduce nature author, public speaker, and environmental advocate Kathleen Dean Moore. She's a distinguished professor emeritus of philosophy from Oregon State University, who recently retired to devote more time to climate talks and her writing. In 2010, she co-edited a collection of essays by 100 world visionaries entitled Moral Ground, Ethical Actions for a Planet in Peril. She will offer her perspective on just what our work is as we stand on the cliff edge of climate chaos. I, for one, will be listening for what one person can do in the world that we have now created, because sometimes I just don't know. It is my hope that her speech for us, as well as our conversations afterwards, will help us figure out how to cope with the drastic changes that come with a rapidly warming planet. As a scientist, I think that life on Earth will persist, but the question is whether humanity will be part of the new ecosystems that emerge. Let's hear what Kathleen Dean Moore has to offer us. Isn't she wonderful? <laughs> Do you know, Davis, how lucky you are? You know, I, I'm usually speaking to people who are in absolute despair. They are panicked. They are being bullied by the oil companies. They're defending their land. They're, they're harassing 
absolutely impotent politicians. And they come to me not saying, what is, what is it that I can do, but how are we gonna live through this grief? And here I come here, and I'm getting a crooked neck from shaking my head at all you're able to do. You guys shouldn't have brought me. You should have brought a brass band. You should have brought the Hallelujah Chorus. I mean, the things that we're hearing from all of you about what you're able to accomplish just make my heart race and soar. And uh, I, I can't wait to go home to Corvallis and tell people, you know what? It can be done. It's happening. And we are getting left behind. I, I've given up on this notion of a grassroots movement. I think it's time, when I listen to what's happening here, I think it's time for us to move away from this notion that we are blades of grass. <laughs> I don't have a clicker, so this is kind of a virtual clicker. <laughs> Thank you. That's what I needed was the grass. You know, for a while we had this metaphor about what the climate movement was about, that it was a grassroots movement, and that um, we were all standing there and uh, standing straight up and reaching for the sun, and, and our roots were reaching for the nourishment and sharing nourishment. But if you think about it, grassroots movement doesn't make very much sense. You know, grassroots don't really move unless they get ripped somehow out of the soil. And when I hear what's happening here, it, it just makes me realize that we need a new metaphor. And so today, what I, I do want to offer you a metaphor that is like more honest about what's happening. Like I hear energy and I hear joy and I hear speed and sudden change. I hear rifts and, and uprootedness and floods and convergences and power here in this room. And so we need a metaphor that is more hydrological to match that. <laughs> click. Maybe I should just say click instead of being so imperious. So I have been actually thinking a lot about rivers lately. I was the uh, writer in residence at Denali National Park in Alaska uh, two years ago in June. And I lived in a little cabin with my husband on the east fork of the Toklat River. Uh, it was June, it was solstice, it was Alaska, it was murderously hot. At midnight on the porch of our cabin, it was 104 degrees. Now I don't know what that feels like to a Californian, but to an Alaskan, 104 degrees feels like hell. And it was an all-time record, and it was drawing uh, this new spike on the graphs of these increasing records uh, being heat in, uh, increasing heat in Alaska. And even the doll sheep had come down from the mountains, those blazing mountains, and they were standing in the river. Now, also they were record-breaking, not only heat, but record-breaking mosquitoes. So I'm the kind of person who would rather be bitten than hot, and my husband is the kind of person who would rather be hot than bitten. So I'm lying there half naked, swatting mosquitoes, and he's lying completely covered by a white sheet. He looked dead. <laughs> And worse than that, all the doors and the windows were open to let in whatever breeze there might have been coming by. But those very doors and windows were also covered with spikes to keep the grizzly bears from pawing their way and clawing their way into the cabin. So my job was if I heard a snuffling, I was supposed to jump out of bed and slam the door shut on the bear's nose. So here's the deal. I had come to the Toklat River to think about global warming and it really wasn't going well. <laughs> yeah, that's what I want, good. So the thing that is occurring to me is that we, we are all caught up in a river that's rushing towards this hot and a stormy and a dangerous planet. And the river is powered by huge amounts of money that are invested in mistakes that are dug into the very structure of the land, the very structure of our buildings. It's a tangled, braided river of fearful politicians and preoccupied consumers and reckless corporations and bewildered children and all of us feeling in some sort of way helpless. So the question is, how are we ever going to change this current? There wasn't any way I was going to fall asleep that night, of course, so I went and pulled some clothes on and went down to the river and I walked along the bank there the currents were just sloshing from all this meltwater from the glacier, and they looked completely unpredictable and chaotic. But there were patterns. 
Now, I'm a river girl, and I grew up, and I'll bet you did too, along rivers throwing stones in and making dams and disrupting the course of the river. So we know that any disruption of a river can reshape the current. And where the water piles up against an obstacle, it loses energy and it drops its load. So whenever water curls around an obstacle in the river, the current's own force turns it upstream, yes? And when there are so many obstacles and so many islands that a channel can't carry its water and its sediment anymore, it crosses a stability threshold and the river finds a different way. We knew this, and so there I was at the river, and sure enough, a root ball fell off the side of the river, and it ran down the river, rolled down the river, and jammed up against a stone. There were pocket eddies that curled around behind it. The force of the river turned itself in a different direction. With every disturbance, the river turned itself in a different direction. Disturbance creates more disturbance. Islands create themselves. So we have another one. So I shoved a rock into the river, and that changing current made me just begin to grin, because I realized then that we do not have to stop the river. Our work, large and small, collective and individual, is to make one deflection in complacency, that's what you people are doing here, to make one obstruction to profits, to invent a better way to heat our homes without burning stuff up, to move ourselves around without burning stuff up, to make a blockage of business as usual, to make a stoppage to the lies, and another and another, to change the energy of the flood. And as this river that we're caught in swirls around all these snags and subversions, the current is going to slow, it will lose power. It will eddy in new directions and create new systems and structures that change the course forever. So this is the work that you all are doing that has me so astonished. This is the, these are the alternatives that you're creating that make it harder for that river to maintain its energy. This is the work of creative disruption, I call it. And what I'm seeing in this room is the work of radical imagination. Imagination that, that, it, that tears at the roots of what has been done and creates something different. It's the work of witness. It's this, all these beautiful things you're doing which are so much better than standing by a river and stewing, stewing in the night. So actually that's my message tonight is that all of us are called to choose our stone and chuck it in. Skip in a bunch of stones or get together with your friends and roll in a boulder. I'm seeing this happening heave in a log or the, or the rib cage of a drowned sheep. It doesn't matter. Get in the way of the old way and create something new. And we all need to learn this word avulsion. And I think California is going to see an avulsion before any of the rest of this country does. Avulsion is a hydrological term for the very moment when the stream bed has so many blockages, so many different ways that it can't carry its load and it flips overnight, and it carves a new direction. So that's how I like to think about the work that we're called to do. But there are many questions, and tonight I want to ask three. Can we have the three questions? Here they are. The first question is, why? Why me? Why any of us? Why do we have to do this work to keep the growth economy, the extractive economy, from wrecking the world. Second question is, what is standing in the way of this work? What makes it so hard to get going? And the third question is, what are we going to do about that? So, okay, question one, why bother? Why are you here tonight? Why am I here tonight? We'll all be dead before the worst parts of this hit the fan. What does it matter? that a hundred years from now, salmon are still returning to the streams? What does it matter that healthy children will still be humming themselves to sleep? What does it matter that sandhill cranes will be burbling in the meadows? The answer that I would bring is that it's an issue of moral obligation. And what's clear to me is that although climate change is a scientific problem, it's a legal problem, it's an economic problem, it's an engineering problem, it's surely a national security problem, but it's fundamentally a moral problem, 
and it calls for a moral response. It's not just stupid to wreck the world, it's wrong to take whatever we need for our profligate lives and leave a ransacked and destabilized world for the children, that's selfish beyond imagining. Or to let it slip away, the song in a frog's throat, or the evergreen hillsides, the snowpack on the mountains, the chances of the children because we're too busy or because we don't care enough to let it slip away, that's a sin. And one more thing, when the big oil executives, to increase their already unimaginable profits, to increase their profits, they knowingly take down the great planetary systems that sustain human life and all the other lives on Earth, that's moral monstrosity on a cosmic scale. But then, but then the philosopher in me kicks in and I say, I can't just say these things. That's pontificating, like a pontiff. I have to give reasons for these things that I, these claims that I'm making. I have to give reasons to support my views. And I am. I'm committed to moral reasoning, this reason public discourse that allows us to affirm our deepest beliefs and check them against our actions, our own actions and other actions. So scientists have this wonderful, overwhelming consensus about the facts of climate change backed up by evidence. What we need is a corresponding consensus about the moral urgency of climate action, backed up by a clear idea of our values. So I wanna, I wanna think about the logic of this, and in order to do that, I have to take you back to Aristotle, to the practical syllogism. Can we have that, Bill? I'm sorry, I told you. One more. Okay. You know, I, I, I am a philosopher, and that's what you paid for. <laughs> so here it comes. Any argument that reaches a conclusion about what we ought to do is going to have to have two premises. The first premise is a factual premise based on empirical evidence. This is the way the world is. This is the way the world will be if we continue in this fashion or this is the way the world will be if we change our ways. But you can't get from a statement of fact to a conclusion about what we ought to do without another premise, the second premise. And that premise is a normative premise. It's an evaluative premise. It's a moral premise. And it says, this is good and this is not as good. This is just and this is unjust. This is beautiful and this is, is profane. This is what I really care about. This is what I would give my life for. This is what I value. This is what I want the world to be. If we know the way the world is, and if we know the way we want it to be, then and only then can we reach a conclusion about what we ought to do. So, so what, what I'm calling for is the work of the second premise. This is our calling now is to be clear about the second premise. What do we dream? What do we cherish? What do we seek? If we're not clear about that, then we don't know where to aim. The environmental activism can't just be against things. The question is, what are we for? So now, at this point, a lot of people say to me, oh, you know, you are such a philosopher and so unrealistic. Of course you think it's a moral issue, that's what your work is, but actually be real. Ethics doesn't change anything. It's not about people's vision of the good. It's all about the economy, stupid. <laughs> yeah. But I say that that's a misreading of history. And that every major change in U.S. history has been the result of a rising wave of moral affirmation. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, a ringing affirmation of a beautiful moral principle, and the monarchs in Europe fell like dominoes. Or, all persons held as slaves within any state shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And against all the economic arguments, 
history reversed its flow. Or, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up. It took many, many years. It's a still process under, still, we're still working through that process, but the troopers and those growling dogs stumble back. Hell no, I won't go, and a stupid war ended. What if we stood up for what we believed in? What if we came up with a new declaration of independence? All beings have a right to a healthy and life-sustaining planet. And this right overrides the presumed right of the few to plunder the common heritage and destabilize the Earth's future without restraint. What if we had a new dream? Earth shall be healed and whole again. So because I wanted to, with my colleagues, start this conversation about the second premise, um, we wrote to about 100 of the world's moral leaders, and we asked them, in 2,000 words or less, to answer the question, do we have a moral obligation to the future to leave a world as rich in possibilities as our own? We got back incredible responses, and we put them together into the book. Can we see the cover of the book, Bill? No, we can't. Okay. <laughs> Um, we came, they, they came back and we, we put all them together into categories and there were basically 15 different reasons why we have to stop climate change. And I want to read them all. Why do we have to stop climate change? For the survival of humankind. For the sake of the children. For the sake of the earth. For the sake of all forms of life on the planet. To protect human rights to honor our duties of gratitude, for the full expression of human virtue, because all flourishing is mutual, for the stewardship of divine creation, because compassion requires it, because justice demands it, because the world is beautiful, because we love the world, because we honor earth and earth systems, and because our moral integrity requires us to do what's right. Note the pluralism. Note the parallel pleading. We're not looking for one big fat reason we can all buy into. We're saying it doesn't matter what value system or what worldview you bring to this table. There is a good reason based on your values for working to protect the world. It's about fundamental human values. So I thought, you know, for tonight, what I would do is pick out two of these values that speak particularly to me. I'm going to speak about the um, love for the earth and the love for children. So could we have, yes. I want to say that if we allow climate change to take its course, it will be a failure of reverence. You know, wonder, wonder at the extraordinary chance that we find ourselves in the Cenozoic era where evolution has achieved its greatest fullness of flowering. The theologian Thomas Berry called it the most lyric period in world history. Imagine our good fortune to live in the time of thrush song and 30,000 species of orchids a time of microscopic sea angels with tiny wings and whales that teach each other to sing, a time of crocodiles and butterflies with curled tongues, and a bat no bigger than a bee. Thomas Berry went on to say, it's our generation that's witnessing the end of the era that we evolved in. My generation has done what no previous generation could do because they lacked the technological power and what no future generation will be able to do because the planet will never again be so beautiful or abundant. The Earth has seen extinction before. At the end of the Jurassic period, an asteroid killed 89% of the living beings, including the dinosaurs. Is it possible that we are now living through an event of equal power? In the last 40 years, 39% of terrestrial wildlife is gone. 
39% of marine wildlife gone, 76% of freshwater wildlife gone in our lifetimes. In the poor countries, the extinctions are even greater because, of course, we export our environmental degradation. There, the losses are 58%. We can start tearing out the pages of our field guides. What is the cause? That's not hard to know. Deforestation, a dramatic loss of habitat, over-harvesting of the oceans, poisoning of land and air, agricultural expansion, but most of all, ocean acidification and climate change. And what causes that? A way of life. A constantly growing, all-consuming culture driven by extractive industries that have few moral or legal constraints. It's madness, the trades we make. It's a desecration. Unless something stops us, we're going to keep on converting living creatures into dead commodities. We trade deep, mossy forests for uselessly large garages. We trade wide-winged albatrosses for plastic six-pack rings. We trade meadows that are miraculous with butterflies for industrial parks to manufacture plastic toys. Dear God, it's mad. We trade a singing marsh for another Kmart parking lot. It's madness, this consumption, this eating up. We trade rhinoceros horn for male sexual potency. We trade bear spleens for sexual potency. We trade Tibetan red deer for sexual potency. What is this overriding need? We trade fence rows and goose sloughs for yet more golf course grass seed. For corn to burn in our cars, we're happy to give up monarch butterflies. For one more fitness center, we give up the spring chorus of crog, frogs. For oil terminals, we give up the salmon. It's a frenzied mad auction of what is of ancient value for what is cheap and desperately sad. It's a mad rush to the end of the world. And the most terrible trade is the transmogrification of plant and animal matter into human flesh. Daniel Quinn says that since 1970, the biomass of the human species has gained 50 million tons. It came from other members of the community of life. As a result, the world is losing 150 species a day. We are turning 150 species a day into human fat and gristle. So the point that I want to make, I probably have already made, is that I, it doesn't really matter whether you think that the world was created by God or whether you think it was created by the, the, the beautiful, urgent creativity of the universe. Either way, the world is irreplaceable. It's essential. It's beautiful and fearsome and beyond human understanding. To me, that's the language of the sacred. I would say that this restless destruction is a desecration and that climate change is a failure of reverence. Number two, if we let climate change blow up, we will have betrayed our love for the children. According to a new letter of consensus uh, from 500 scientists that are led from a, by a team from Stanford, unless we take concrete immediate action, by the time today's children have grown to middle age, the life support systems of the earth will be irretrievably damaged. Who are these children? I know one of them. Her name is Zoe and she is my granddaughter. And in the evening she lies in bed and she sings herself to sleep. When she's middle-aged, the, the Earth's life support systems will be irretrievably damaged. Unless we stop fossil fuels, they'll live as best they can in a world of violent, chaotic weather northerly spreading disease, water shortage, collapsed agricultural and fishery systems, wars for resources, massive movements of people driven from their homes by flood or wildfire or starvation. That's a betrayal of the children. Here, here's Brian Doyle, my poet friend from Portland. I said, put this into words for me, Brian. And he said, we 
may not betray our children because we swore and vowed to every God we ever imagined or invented or dimly sensed that we would care for them with every iota of our energy when they came to us miraculously from the sea of the stars because they are the very definition of innocent and every single blow and shout and shiver and fear that rains down on them is utterly undeserved and unfair and unwarranted. And because we used to be them, and we remember dimly what it was like to be small and frightened and confused. I want to read from Moral Ground the, a little, little section, just a couple paragraphs from a piece that I wrote for the section about our love for our children, if I may. In the spring, when our granddaughter was born, I brought her to the pond so she could feel the comfort I had known there for so many years. Killdeer waddled in the mud by the shore, but not so many as before. Ahead of the coming heat, butterflies fed in the mud between the cracks, unrolling their tongues to touch salty soil. I held my granddaughter in my arms and sang to her then, an old lullaby that made her soften like wax in a flame molding her little body to my bones. She fell asleep in my arms, unafraid. I will tell you, I was so afraid. Poets warned us, writing of the heartbreaking beauty that will remain when there is no heart to break for it. But what if it's worse than that? What if it's the heartbroken children who remain in a world without beauty? How will they find solace in a world without wild music? How will they thrive without green hills edged with oaks? How will they forgive us for letting frog songs slip away? It isn't enough to love a child and wish her well. It isn't enough to open my heart to a bird-graced morning. Can I claim to love a morning if I don't protect what creates its beauty? Can I claim to love a child if I don't use all the power of my beating heart to preserve a world that nourishes children's joy? Loving is not a kind of la-di-da. Loving is a sacred trust. To love is to affirm the absolute worth of what you love and to pledge your life to its thriving, to protect it fiercely and faithfully for all time. Ring the Angelus for the salmon and the swallows. Ring the bells for frogs floating in bent reeds. Ring the bells for all of us who did not save the songs. Mother of God, ring the bells for every sacred emptiness. Let them echo in the silence at the end of the day. Forgiveness is too much to ask. I would pray for only this, that our granddaughter would hear again the little lick of music, that grace note toward the end of a meadowlark's song. Meadowlarks. There were meadowlarks. They sang like angels in the morning. Katie, are you out there? Katie? Katie said, tell us what to say to people who say it's not urgent. Tell us what to say to, to people who say, you know, don't worry about it. And here's what I want to say in response to that question, Katie. Ask them what they love. What do they love more than anything else in the whole world? What would they give their life for? And then ask them to imagine how the object of their love will do in a world that's racked by storms. And when they start to put those two ideas together, then tell them, you know, your love is a call to action. If you are a person who loves, then you are a person who will act on climate change because no matter what it is that you love, climate change is going to kick it in the teeth. But anyway, it's tougher than that, isn't it, Katie? Because there are more, there are, there are things that are blocking us from acting. And Bill, can we see my question slide again? What's blocking action? What's blocking us from what we're doing? What we need, what's blocking us from what we need to do? And I want to mention a couple falsehoods that I think we need to deal with um, before we'll be able to make any progress. And the first one 
is from Pogo. It's this idea that we have met the enemy and he is us. This idea is a killer. It stops action. The idea that unless you are pure, unless you don't drive a car, then you can't say anything against the pollution and the, and the destruction of the, um, uh, uh, the destruction of the climate. Uh, this, is a, this is a mistake. Um, <laughs> here, here's what I, I want to say, that it may be one of the biggest triumphs of big oil to make us blame ourselves for climate change, even while the corporations are spending billions to, tr to transform us into mindless consumers of self-destructive but cheap consumer products and fossil fuels. To make us blame ourselves, even as they leverage their bribes in Congress to be sure that we have no alternative ways to heat our homes or travel to our jobs or find some way to ease our grief. So when I peer, hear people say, we've met the enemy and he is us, I want to think about it really carefully because of course we should spend and invest and work and travel more thoughtfully. Of course we should dramatically cut our use of fossil fuels. Of course we should be doing all the things that you're doing in Davis to make the system work better. That said, the big oil companies are very happy to claim that they're simply responding to public demand when in fact they are manipulating public demand to increase even now, increase our uses of fossil fuels. I'm not the one who builds and maintains infrastructures that force consumers to use fossil fuels. I'm not the one that convinces politicians to kill or underfund alternative energy or transportation initiatives. I'm not the one who increases demand by advertising. I'm not the one who hires bogus scientists to try to create confusion about the harmful effects of burning fossil fuels. I'm not out there using my money to influence elections to defang the regulatory agencies. We have met the enemy, and I'm gonna do everything I can to make sure it isn't me. But while big oil is externalizing all its other costs on us, I'm not gonna let it externalize the moral shame of its attack on the earth. <laughs> Mistake number two. Okay, so I'll read this to you because it's a cute little cartoon and up on the whiteboard there's this bulleted list of all the things that can be accomplished if you address climate change. And you know this because you're doing this in your community. Energy independence. Preserve forests, sustainability, green jobs, livable cities, healthy children, fresh food, environmental justice, renewable fuels, clean air, quiet, clean water. And then down there, do you see that guy? He's saying, yeah, but what if climate change is a big hoax and we create a better world for nothing? <laughs> the thing is, there's something really important missing from that list. And if we can fight back against the, uh, the forces that would corrupt our democracy in order to preserve the hegemony of big oil, then we can put reclaim democracy up on that list too. You, know, you already know the dollar figures. I'm not even going to bother. I'll just, I will just remind us all of the, the Koch brothers' pledge of $889 million for the next elections. Cheap at any price, if it lets an industry continue to make the kind of profits that we're talking about there. So let me just talk about Plato. Because way back in ancient Greece, he had it figured. He was not a fan of democracy, he was frightened of democracy. Because he said you can always buy votes. And there are always people who won't care enough to think carefully. The Greek word for those people who don't involve themselves in careful thinking about elections is idiotes. <laughs> That's useful to know. <laughs> they, didn't, they, they knew that everyone could buy, all the politicians could buy votes. And so it was a natural progression, an inevitable progression, he said, from democracy to plutocracy, 
the government of the few and the rich. And every plutocracy, he said, devolves into anarchy because poor people will only put up with so much injustice. So have we moved from a democracy to a plutocracy? Yes. And if we have, will we be able to return to a democracy or will we devolve into an anarchy? To me, it is that serious. Of course, you know that Plato's solution was the philosopher king. To make the philosopher kings, I think that's about the worst idea in the universe. <laughs> Mistake number three, if you would. Oops. Uh, yeah. I, I, I want to be careful about this because I tend to rant. I, I am very, very worried that we have moved quickly away from mitigating climate change, that is to say pushing back against oil and fossil fuels, pushing back against the companies, pushing back against the harm, and have moved very quickly towards adapting to living in it, in a, in a, in a world that is not as rich. And it worries me if we take energy away from the stopping the harm, putting it towards adapting to the harm, even though I know that we're already in a position where we will adapt in many ways. So I want to offer you a quiz because professors do offer quizzes. So here's the question. It's multiple choice, so don't worry. When your house is on fire, what should you do? A, not one damn thing. B, defame the people who called 911 to report the blaze. C, debate whether the fire is caused by humans or natural fluctuations in temperature. D, write a grant to study the effect of fire on children. E, formulate a business plan to corner the market on corrugated metal roofing for hovels. F, appoint a commission to study how to adapt to life in the burnt out husk of a house. Or G, for God's sake, put out the fire while there's still something to save. And I know that whenever you give a multiple choice quiz, the students always want a hint, so here's a hint. Imagine that your children are in the house, and not only your children, but 109 billion other children. Imagine that this house is beautiful beyond imagining, that you have been happy in this house that it's a sheltering, nourishing place that provides water and warmth and food. Imagine, in fact, that this house is the only possible source of everything your life and happiness depend on. And imagine that there is still a chance to save the house, or at least large parts of it. But it's a narrow, perilously narrow chance, and it depends on throwing everything we've got at the fire. So what are we gonna to say to Rex Tillerson, who is the chairman, president, and chief executive officer of ExxonMobil, who says, as a species, we have spent our entire existence adapting so we can adapt to climate change. Our primary obligation is to stop the reckless destruction. And to the extent that adaptation takes away from that effort, I worry about it a great deal. Particularly in places like New York where the adaptation is designed to protect a way of life rather than designed to be truly adaptive in a natural way. But the worst of the three of the four mistakes that I've isolated is this one that's about to come. There is no hope. It's too late. Let's face it. Our options are limited. Our cities and our homes and transportation systems are disgracefully designed. Destructive ways of living are tangled in skeins of profit, immense profit, and power around the world. Corporations, many of them, are behaving like psychopaths, and we have run out of time. The most conscientious person is going to have a very hard time making change. Gus Speth says, all we have to do to destroy the planet's climate and ecosystems and leave a ruined world to our children and grandchildren is to keep doing exactly what we are doing today. And there's new polling 
And I'm happy to report that I don't see it here at all. They say that the people who are concerned about climate change, 85% feel afraid, 81% feel sad, 79% feel angry, 76% feel disgusted, and 61% feel helpless. What, what impresses me so much about the last six hours is the way in which you folks are showing that the antidote to despair is action. Active hope, it's beautiful. But to lose hope is really a problem. And, and the problem is that we build a society that's based on the future and that we measure everything we do by its consequences. And so we built a society that can be disempowered both by hope and by hopelessness. So blind hope, everything will be, <laughs> how does that song go? Everything is gonna be all right. Everything is gonna be all right and so I don't have to do anything, it's fine. Or blinding despair, no matter what I do, everything is gonna be awful so I don't have to do anything. Moral abdication on both sides. But the point is that that's a false dichotomy, it's a fallacy. And in this broad area between hope and despair is this moral ground that we call, is this broad ground that we call moral integrity. It's this whole essential middle ground that's acting not because you hope to make a difference or because you despair of making a difference, but because you want to do what you think is right. So integrity is this matching, this oneness, this wholeness, of, of, of what you believe is right and what you actually do. So a person lives a life of integrity who lives gratefully because he believes that life is a gift or acts reverently because she believes the world is sacred or lives simply because she doesn't believe in taking more than her fair share or acts lovingly toward the world because they love it. And this means a fierce and tireless and maybe tragic defense of the world against those who would, who would wreck it. So we come to the last question. Bill? So what are we gonna do? You're doing them. Three things and we have to do them all. This list comes from Joanna Macy. There are three kinds of rocks we're gonna push into this river. The first one, and if I could have the rings on the water. Thank you. The first thing she says that we need to do is stop the harm. We need holding actions to slow the damage to Earth and its beings. We have to stop making it worse, which means we have to stop releasing greenhouse gases. We have to leave the ancient carbon in the ground. So this is the question each of us asks individually and collectively. What destruction can I stop? What oil terminal? What parking lot? What coal train? What poison spraying truck? What pipeline? What corrupt politician can I stop? Choose one, move fast. Hold your leaders to account. If they sell out to the culture of destruction, throw them out. If they stand courageously against it, stand with them. Not another tundra plain. Not another rainforest. Not another estuary. Not another canyon land or Oregon farm. Not another mighty river can be traded away for cash. These are not industries to take or to sell. They belong to the future of the everlasting earth. Number two. Number one, stop the harm. Number two, radically reimagine our life ways and livelihoods to match our vision of a sustainable and thriving world. You people are number two. You are doing number two. Trying to create new ways, new ways to live lives that are sustainable and beautiful and joyous. You are trying to radically reimagine how we can feed ourselves and warm ourselves and catch and, and catch and share energy without burning stuff up. And then you're imagining those new life ways into existence. It's thrilling to me to see this. Brian Doyle again says, have we gone stale and dim as a species? Let us send our wild, holy imagination into the future. Yes, let's do that. I'm sick, sick, sick of an ethic of regulation. 
how much destruction can I do and profit from before some sort of rule shuts me down? That's not a moral standard. I yearn, I yearn for an ethic of affirmation and aspiration. What is a good corporation? What is a thriving city? What is an honorable harvest? What is a good life? If capitalism can serve us and save the earth, show me how. How can I make my life into a work of art that reflects my deepest values? And then finally, the third step is to create a paradigm shift in our understanding of ourselves and our place on this planet. We are soft-bodied, mortal, imagining creatures who are woven into beautiful, interdependent webs of wildly creative life. So let me just end by reading you <coughs> from Clarissa Estes. And here's what she says. She says, do not lose heart. We were made for these times. Yes, for years we have been learning, practicing, been in training for, and just waiting to meet on this exact plane of engagement. I recognize a seaworthy vessel when I see one. There have never been more able vessels in the water than there are right now across the world. And they are fully provisioned and able to signal one another as never before in the history of humankind. There will always be times when you feel discouraged. I too have felt despair many times in my life, but I do not keep a chair for it. I will not entertain it. It is not allowed to eat from my plate. I hope you will write this on your wall. When a great ship is in harbor and moored, it is safe. There can be no doubt. But that is not what great ships are built for. Cool Davis, you are a great ship. The currents are shifting under your hull, and you are under sail. Congratulations to you, and thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I um, am always reluctant to answer questions because I've already told you everything I know or have ever thought of. <laughs> but there's one more thing I want to say, and that is that we will be resuming this conversation in the morning. And um, perhaps you could tell people when and where. And the other thing I would like to do uh, before we close is ask each of you to turn to a person near you whom you haven't already met, introduce yourself, and tell that person what you love too much to lose. Will you do that now? All right. What was it? Wasn't that just amazing? Wasn't that just amazing? Let's say thank you again. Just as, as a word of closing, the, direct, the in, information for where to go tomorrow is in your program. If you don't, if you don't see that, check with one of the uh, Cool Davis board members, myself or Bill, or we'll, we'll be around out in the lobby. I uh, wanted to say one more thing, uh, well, actually two more things. One is that we have this key that belongs to someone. It doesn't say Tesla, but... Uh, <laughs> It's probably a very cool bike or something like that. So uh, we pick that up outside. If it belongs to you, see me right afterwards. The second thing is uh, to mention in response to the comments here,
that when I was at Copenhagen for the UN conference a few years ago, and I was standing in a very cold line in the snow waiting to get my ticket to get in and, and to get my credentials, there were people from all over the world there. And I really mean that. People from Africa, Asia, all mixed in line, having great conversations with each other. And of course, we came around to asking, where are you from? And when I told them I was from the United States, there was quietness and sort of, well, you know, well, you guys aren't doing very good. But when I told them I was from California, they all came back and we could be friends. <laughs> and I feel the same way today, but so much more. And uh, for Davis too, for Cole Davis. These are challenging numbers here, but this is something that we each can do and it's positive and it's a good thing. And it's good on so many levels as we heard tonight. And in this respect, Cool Davis is about action. California is about action. The work that I do is about action. The work that's done at the CC is about action. California is not sitting on its laurels. California is doing things. And the gift we give to our nation when we do that is not just about Davis. When we show that these things can be done that we can have livable, great homes that don't use very much energy at all, that we can reduce our water, that we can have a great, vibrant community, that we're generating more jobs than anywhere else in the nation. When we show that, and we're still improving our environment and moving forward, then we are doing something not just for ourselves, but for the nation and the world. The UN meeting that just finished in Peru had a, they talked about subnationals. They're realizing that at the nation level, it's very hard to do something about climate change. But where is the action? It's at the regions, the counties, and the cities. And it's possible in Paris, there may be a separate place for those organizations, simply because that's where the action is and that's where it's happening. And I imagine that we will have some people from Davis there at the meeting that's going to be in Paris at the end of this year talking about what the world continue, the world conversation. Moving past this, the nations where we know our nation is having a difficult time with this crazy time. It, it just, it's just crazy what's going on in D.C., the conversations. But I come back to California and I see positive things going on. And every one of you are doing that, and I we very much appreciate that. So from Cool Davis, thank you very much for coming tonight. I hope this has given you a lot to think about.